the third perspective sees value in nature. It's often called an ecological ethic. Uh, David, Henry David Thoreau is an example of this. For I had rather be a child and pupil in the forest wild than to be the king of men elsewhere and most sovereign slave of care. To have one moment of thy dawn than share the city's year forlorn. Um, of course, we know that Thoreau was a nature lover. And he found value in nature. And so do people that propound what is called an ecological ethic. More than any other... Uh, the name associated with this view is, is Holmes Ralston III. Um, Ralston is often called the father of environmental ethics. He won the 2003 Templeton Prize for Progress in Science and Religion. Uh, I, I can't say I know him. I've met him. We've talked on a number of occasions. Um, a couple of years ago, I tried to get him to come out here to speak at Biola. Uh, he is a Christian, a fine gentleman. He's from Western Virginia. He has this soft Virginia gentleman kind of air about him. Uh, he's a trained naturalist. He's published articles in natural history as well as philosophy. Um, when I tried to get him to come out here, it was just after he'd won the Templeton Prize, and he was in great demand everywhere, and he traveled so much. As you can tell, he's an elderly man now. And uh, his health wasn't, wasn't good enough to come, although he, he said he would really like to come, and we just weren't able to get him. But Ralston has developed this ecological ethic. He's a professor now emeritus at Colorado State University in uh, uh, Fort Collins, Colorado. And he's the author of two of the articles that I gave you and this book, uh, which is a, really a fun book, a collection of his writings called Philosophy Gone Wild. Isn't that a great name? <laughs> Uh, for a collection of writings about ecological ethics or environmental ethics. Now, Ralston is a, is a devout believer. He's a Presbyterian. Um, as far as I know, he, he still is a Presbyterian. Uh, although I understand, somebody told me that they thought he was in an Episcopalian church. Now, I, I don't, don't know about that. But uh, those of you that, that have done the reading for credit for the class, you, you've read two of his articles. And you can see a depth there in a different perspective than the other two that we've looked at so far. He says there are three bases for an environmental ethic. First is homeostasis. Roughly, homeostasis means the balance of nature. This is perhaps, Ralston says, the paramount law in ecological theory. Ecosystems tend towards homeostasis. That is, the right balance of the species. For example, in south central Colorado, there's a, a valley that's about nine or 10,000 feet in elevation. On one side of the 14,000 foot Sangre de Cristo Mountains, and on the other side, 14,000 foot San Juan Mountains. And aside from tourism, the two main industries in the San Luis Valley are potato farming and sheep ranching. The biggest enemy of the potato farmers are rabbits. The biggest enemy of the sheep ranchers are coyotes. Now, you have these four species, potatoes, rabbits, sheep, coyotes. And what happens when, when the rabbits begin to multiply and eat too many potatoes, then the potato farmers put out poison and poison the rabbits. And as the rabbit population dies, the coyotes will risk attacking the sheep. And they start bringing down lambs. And so the sheep ranchers go to the Colorado legislature and get a bounty instituted, and they start killing coyotes. And as the coyote population drops, what happens to the rabbit population? Mm -hmm. And you have this constant oscillation. You would think that it would tend towards some kind of a homeostatic situation. The, the, the problem is human interference won't let it. It's constantly oscillating. And in the San Luis Valley, they always have arguments between the potato farmers and the sheep ranchers, coyotes and rabbits. But in a natural ecosystem, you wind up having a balance. 
you're probably familiar with the fact that in the Greater Yellowstone ecosystem, they introduced wolves a few years back. Uh, part of the reason was the elk population uh, was spreading too fast. In, in Rocky Mountain National Park and in the little town of Estes Park just outside in Colorado, um, the predators are gone. And there, 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 there's some bears, no wolves, uh, but the, no grizzlies, they're, they're, they're black bears. And the elk population has just exploded. And they're decimating aspen groves inside the park. And they mess up the town of Estes Park. Have any of you been there and seen all the elk wandering through? If you want a picture of an elk, go ahead. Go in October when the elk are bugling, uh, calling their mates. It's a great time. The, the, the point is, once we interfere with the predator-prey relationships, we wind up with an ecosystem out of balance. Naturally, ecosystems tend towards homeostasis, a balance. And Ralston said, this is a basis for an ecological ethic. That is, we ought to strive to keep entire ecosystems as natural as possible so that the balance of nature is preserved. Second, ecosystemic holism. These two are related. That is, all the species in the ecosystem are necessary. <laughs> On our honeymoon, uh, I was, uh, in, in the Air Force then and assigned to a, uh, a pilot training base in South Georgia. And Christmas of, of our first, it wasn't our honeymoon, it was Christmas of our first year of marriage, we went down to the Everglades over Christmas vacation. And uh, we love to go to the national parks and the first thing we do is go to the visitor center and listen to all the, all the movies and look at the displays and then we go out. And, but we're camping there, we listen to Ranger talk and he was talking about, about ecosystemic holism and the balance of species. And everybody was sitting there swatting the mosquitoes. And my wife said, what role do mosquitoes play in the ecosystem? And he said, food for the birds. And she said, well, if you give it to the mosquitoes, I'll pay for the seeds. And, <laughs> but you know that wouldn't work. There's, there's more involved in maintaining the balance than just replacing mosquitoes with seeds. They do more than that. And Ralston says, recognizing this holism is a value that we ought to seek to maintain. And it's enough to ground an environmental ethic. Third, he finds, and this is the most interesting, value in nature, and this is the point of one of his articles that you read, there is intrinsic value in nature. Now there's, there's several different kinds of value. First of all, there is instrumental value. Something is instrumentally valuable if it's useful for something else. If, if you saw somebody who was collecting money, and every now and then, of course, you read an article in the newspaper about someone living in a, in a cheap motel on Skid Row that dies and they find their mattress stuffed with $100,000. You say, something's wrong with that. Uh, why, why do you want money? If they answered, oh, because I want money, because it's money, there's something wrong with that. You want money because it's useful for something. It's instrumentally useful. Money in itself is, is nothing. Money to be used for something, uh, now that's, that's instrumental. On the other hand, if you ask somebody about health, why do you want to be healthy? Legitimately, you can say, I, because it's good to be healthy. And it is. It's better to be healthy than sick. But they might also say, I want to be healthy because I can take missions trips. I want to be healthy because I can do things with my kids and grandkids. I want to be healthy so I can live longer because uh, my mother's coming down with Alzheimer's. I don't want to be able to care for you. Know, I mean, so in that sense, health is instrumental. So it's both intrinsically good and instrumentally good. It's a mixed good, we say. But then there's something like happiness. Do you want to be happy? You want to be happy, Matt? Sure, Matt wants to be happy. Why? Well, that's a dumb question. Why do you want to be happy? I can't say anything more than that. It's an intrinsic good. I don't want to be happy in order to something. It's not instrumental, it's intrinsic, okay? Now, 
Ralston says too often we look at nature only as instrumentally valuable. It's only valuable in what it can do for us. So these great sequoias are good because you get a lot of lumber when you chop them down. So of course the foresters went in and, and we know that John Muir had a lot to do with trying to preserve these great stands of, of sequoias because they, they just saw instrumental value. And, and this of course is always the argument between strip mining, um, burning down uh, the rainforest so that you can grow more uh, sugar cane so you can make more ethanol so that you, know, you can sell it to Americans because the political lobby said you ought to buy ethanol. And, okay, it's instrumental. But Ralston says, no, values in nature are intrinsic, not only instrumental. Perhaps uh, Aldo Leopold, in another essay of his, you read uh, 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 The Land Ethic. By the way, um, as you probably guessed, not all the reading is reading I would agree with. But I wanted you to be exposed to different positions uh, here. And Leopold has good things to say, but I think you, you probably felt, as I hope you did, after he makes a good point, then when he tries to justify it, he seems to flounder, uh, to founder. He, he's, he's not a fish, uh, he founders. He, he doesn't know what's going on in there. And he's, he's, if he had a theocentric ethic, he could do it, but he just can't quite do it from his basis, which would be either biocentric or ecocentric. Uh, but he says this in uh, Thinking Like a Mountain, we reach the old wolf in time to watch a fierce green fire dying in her eyes. He'd, he talked about stalking his wolf and shooting her across a canyon. I realized then and have known ever since that there was something new to me in those eyes, something known only to her and the mountain. I was young then and full of trigger itch I thought that because fewer wolves meant more deer, that no wolves would mean hunter's paradise. But after seeing the green fire die, I sensed that neither the wolf nor the mountain agreed with such a view. See, what he says he came to understand there is that the balance, the predator-prey balance in the, in the montane ecosystem was necessary. And there's value in that. This is Ralston's point, this is Leopold's point. Now, Ralston is charged with what's called the naturalistic fallacy. This has quite a history. The naturalistic fallacy can be defined as the attempt to derive ought from is. So you do a survey of what actually is the case and you say, therefore, this ought to be the case. We find this happening all the time around us. This, the media will sponsor a poll or Gallup or will do a poll and then they will try to say since the majority of people believe this or since the majority of people do this, therefore this ought to be normative. This ought to be acceptable. This ought to be what everyone ought to do. They derive ought from the descriptive is. And philosophers, notably people like Kant and Hume have said, that just doesn't work. You can't get to the ought from the is. When, when I was a kid, the French car company Renault, or Renault, had the slogan, 40 million Frenchmen can't be wrong. <laughs> oh yeah? <laughs> um, when I lived in France, we owned a Renault. I wish we had bought a, a VW Dasher instead. <laughs> Much better engineered. Um, the is doesn't give you the basis for an ought. But Ralston calls that into question. Uh, he says that it's not always wrong. He says we have too much fallen into the opinion that the only values that there are, moral or artistic or whatever, are human values. Values that we have selected or constructed, over which we have labored Modern philosophical ethics has left us insensitive to the reception of non-human values. We need wild nature precisely because it is a realm of value independent of us. And in addressing the charge that this commits a naturalistic fallacy, he says, what is ethically puzzling and exciting 
is the marriage and mutual transformation of ecological description and evaluation. It is that here an ought is not so much derived from an is, but discovered simultaneously with it. So he wants to say that we find value in nature because things in nature are value, they're able to have value, they're value-able, he, he says, they ha are able to have value for other things, not just for humans. And that gives them intrinsic value. So for example, he says, tourists in Yosemite do not value the sequoias as timber, but as natural classics for their age, strength, beauty, resilience, and majesty. This viewing constitutes the tree's value. How many of you have, have visited Yosemite, the, the, the sequoia grows? How many of you walking up to, to what is it, General Grant, is that, or Sherman, General Sherman, that largest living thing on earth? How many of you walk up to that and said, man, that would make about 14 and a half houses? <laughs> Anybody? A lot of plywood in that. There is a lot of plywood, but is that what you thought? <laughs> No, we're, we're awed at the size and awed at the thought that this thing's nearly 3,000 years old or whatever the plaque says. In other words, Val Ralston says, this is our experience. We find value, we discover value. We don't create value based on what it can do for us. Or he says, in looking at the Grand Canyon, we intrinsically value the rock strata with their color bands. What account do we give when excited by a deep sense of time at the Grand Canyon, when we realize that human beings have rarely been there? How do we account for that? There's value there that is not useful to us. Now, I must admit I resonate with this. And partly because I have met Holmes Ralston and, and know him somewhat partly because I love the natural world. But I still want to say there's something right about that. As Christians, when we walk into the world, into nature, when we leave behind us the flat surfaces and right angles that characterize man's work, and we enter the multifarious variety of God's world, we sense value there. Not value that we bring with us, but value that is there independent of us. And that seems right, doesn't it? Are you, does anybody want to argue with that? I mean, you, you, you can. I'm a philosopher, you can argue with me. <laughs> do, you, do you understand what, what Ralston's getting at when he makes this claim? But is this enough? Is this enough? Well, I feel intuitively that the earth is a better place if grizzly bears and Siberian tigers and humpback whales live in the world and thrive. Certainly grizzly bears and humpback whales are of no use to me. And I may never see them. But I think the world is a better place if these are there. But notice who's making that judgment. I am. It seems that value entails a valuer. I don't know how Holmes Ralston can say there is value there if there is no one to do the valuing. There's usefulness, maybe, in maintaining the homeostatic ecosystem. Ralston says, how far is this value so distributed that each individual is obligated to moral conduct towards nature? There is no person who ought not to be concerned with the preservation of natural goodness, if only because others undeniably do find values there. You hear that? If you find the beach, the surf, the tide pools marvelous, if you find great value there, I am obligated, on Ralston's view, I'm obligated to value them because you find value there. But you notice that's a different thing than what he was saying earlier. 
<laughs> it's intrinsically valuable. There's a contradiction in his thinking here. He says, no one has learned the full scope of what it means to be moral until he has learned to respect the integrity and worth of those things we call wild just because people value them. Well, so it comes back to someone making the value judgment, doesn't it? Perhaps this is the, the problem that Ralston has. He isn't Christian enough in his ecological ethic. Ralston has a marvelous essay that he published in the journal uh, Natural History. Uh, he, he is a naturalist, and he, des it's, he describes a pasque flower. The pasque flower is a white flower, grows about this big, very low. It's usually the first flower that, that, that you find in the Rocky Mountains in the spring. Uh, when we lived up, up in the Rockies, we'd, I, I'd go out looking for the pasque flowers as the snow would begin to recede in the, in the areas where there was more clearing among the pine trees, uh, st still have snow banks under the trees, but they'd find the bare spots and you'd, you'd see a pass flower. And I'd go get my wife and lead her out there and we'd, we'd, we'd look at the pass, it's, it's springtime. I remember Martin Luther saying, the Lord has written the promise of resurrection in every green leaf of spring. Uh, we, we thought it was a pass flower. Pasque is the old French word for Easter, and it got its name because it usually appears around Easter time. It's a low flower, uh, very furry. The leaves are very furry, which help it retain its heat. And, and it's low to the ground so that, so that it soaks up the heat from the ground, uh, and at night it, it's, it's protected more. And Ralston wrote a marvelous essay about the Pasch flower, and then he links it to the theological promise of the resurrection and he published this in a secular journal. What he's doing by doing that is saying it has value because of what God made it to be. But his ethic doesn't have room for that. He says value generates poetry, philosophy, and religion, not less than science. And we're awed and humbled by staring into the stormy surf of the midnight sky. These values do not lie in the empirical surface of nature, but now taking these things as signs or sacraments of meaning. I like his ethic, but ultimately he doesn't go far enough. I, I think what he's doing, back to our chart here, as a Christian he sees the need to, to develop an ethic of how we deal as as human beings with nature, and he's cashing it all out in naturalistic terms, there, <laughs> as an ethical naturalist. But even so, even though it's informed by his Christian faith, it's insufficient because it's not grounded in his Christian faith. It's grounded in ecosystemic holism, in homeostasis, and in intrinsic values in nature. John Muir, of course, a great hero of Yosemite, <laughs> says everybody needs beauty as well as bread, places to play in and pray in, where nature may heal and cheer and give strength to body and soul alike. And I think we can, most of us, identify with that. I, I know there are some people who feel really uncomfortable out of their element, out of, out of a city, out of an urban environment. Far more people, I think, feel refreshed, restored in a sense, in a wild place like, well, Yosemite Valley is not a wild place, but uh, <laughs> in, in a place like that, or walking along a coast where the waves are crashing. There's something about the world where humanity has not impressed our imprint on it that's restorative. And that sort of value is there as well. Ralston mentions that in, an, in a different article which I didn't have you read. But he has a very interesting section in one of his articles where he, he says, the natural place, the natural home of human beings is a city. 
In the city, we have education and commerce. We have the arts, education. All these aspects that set us apart from, from the other animals flourish in a city, and we need a city for that to happen. When we lived up in the mountains, we, we weren't even in a town. The nearest town was several miles down the mountain, population 298. Uh, can you imagine what kind of a symphony orchestra they had? <laughs> or ballet? <laughs> or museum? Of course not. Um, these distinctively human productions, economic, educational, artistic, flourish in a city. But then Ralston says the city needs the garden, the rural environment that has been manipulated by humanity, where we irrigate, where we plow, where we pull up the trees and the roots and the rocks so we can plant, because the garden provides the food for the city. We need that. We couldn't have the culture of the city if we didn't have the agriculture of the, of the rural environment. But then he says we also need the wild environment. We need a place, in, in the language of the Wilderness Act of 1964, we need wilderness where man himself is a visitor and does not remain. Land untrammeled by man. It's the Wilderness Act of 1964, use sexist language, okay. <laughs> Ralston says we need that, we need a place where we go in order to sense a bit of perspective on ourselves. Where we realize that we're not masters of everything. Where we cannot stay. And we cannot survive unless we bring some of the city with us. We go there and are restored and then return to the rural or the urban. And that's very poetic in the way he writes that. But I think he's right. I think he's right. If all we had were farms and cities, we'd be missing something. Even if you don't get to the wildlands very often, the knowledge that they're there or seeing pictures of them is restorative, I think. Areas where God, through whatever natural processes he has allowed to occur over the centuries, where God has produced this landscape, this environment, this ecosystem. And we have not messed with it. We need places like that. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Visit biola.edu to find out how Biola could make a difference in your life.